Hello everyone, thanks for joining me again. Today the objective is to become familiar with a couple techniques we can use to assess the health of an ecosystem. And that is a really important thing for ecologists to be able to do, or, or anyone doing environmental impact statements, uh, to go in and gauge the health of what's going on in, in an ecosystem. So the way we're going to do this, in addition to this uh, little flip lecture, is we're also going to be going to a riparian ecosystem and or which is like a creek habitat aquatic habitat and we're going to apply some of the things we talk about today to that ecosystem to uh, determine whether it's healthy or not so here we go uh, once again it's a la cornell uh, our essential question is really so how do we do this how do we assess the health and we're going to take a two-pronged approach with this the first one is going to be a chemical analysis and then the second one is a biological analysis or biological survey about what types of creatures are living there and what, uh, what does that tell us about the ecosystem. And so for the chemical analysis, really what we're talking about here are abiotic measurements. And so when we say abiotic, it means without life or non-living as opposed to biotic with life. And so with abiotic, we're talking about like temperature, light, uh, humidity, dissolved oxygen, uh, nitrates and ammonia levels and different types of pollutants, uh, things like that. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go out and we'll use some equipment and probes and thermometers and, and things like that. And we gather our data and then we got to figure out what it all means. And that's where it gets a little tricky. But one uh, concept that's really important to that is called the range of tolerance. And so I wrote it down here. And so if you can... Uh, I, I would suggest jotting this chart and maybe hitting pause, and I'm going to explain it real quick. And so the idea is, is really getting into how much can an organism tolerate, and uh, where is the organism going to be thriving. And so we've got a, a graph here, and it's going to be the number of individuals, or the level of population on, I guess, the y-axis. And then it's this big bell-shaped curve. Uh, and going along the x-axis, it, it can be a lot of different things. It could, this works for precipitation, uh, light levels, uh, pH, humidity. And, and so the idea is there's a spectrum. And over here we've got low, here we've got high. Uh, and so let's just do it for temperature, for example. And we can, we can do it with people. Um, and so over here to our right is going to be really hot. Let's say this little point here is like 150 degrees. Down here, it's going to be super cold. That point's going to be like, let's say, minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is freezing cold. Even colder than in Minnesota, which is where I grew up. Uh, but so, what happens is, uh, right here in the middle, we've got, let's just say that this is like 67 to 73 degrees. For most people, that's going to be pretty comfortable, right? You're just like, ah, and you're relaxed, and you feel good. And so with this level here, you can see the maximum number of people are, or yeah, in this case, people are surviving at that spot right there. And we're going to call that our optimal zone or our little happy place. So I'm going to put a smiley face there. Uh, but as it warms up, like it did today, it gets, uh, it gets a little uncomfortable and it gets, you get hot and maybe a little cranky and you start to get a little stressed out. And as the temperature keeps going, not, not everybody can survive in these temperatures. Uh, and so if you think about like when big heat waves come through, you know, who, who is having heat strokes? Maybe it's like, you know, sick people or the elderly um, or, or just people with, uh, you know, more fragile systems. But as you go this direction, uh, you go from that stress zone, eventually you start hitting the death zone and, and eventually you, you can't survive. And so out here, everything, you know, people can't survive in 150 degrees. Same thing going over here. It starts to get colder. You start to shiver. Hypothermia kicks in. You're, you're stressed. You're not doing well. And as it gets colder and colder, it's not like everybody kicks it at the same temperature. So, you know, for, for different people, different things are going to do it. Um, and I, I think that a concept applies to all different creatures for all different types of abiotic measurements. And so you can do the same thing with levels of water, levels of light, and so forth. And so I've got one more slide that's around that, and you get kind of a visual. So this would be for plants, and again, it's temperature, and it's show, this time it's in Celsius. Uh, so around 6, 26 to 28 degrees, that's the optimal zone. And you can see that plant is growing uh, as best as it's going to grow. Turn up the temperature, and it can still grow, but it's stunted until pretty soon it, it can't grow anymore. It's the death zone. And same thing if you, uh, if you get really, really cold on that particular plant. 
choose a different plant, you know, maybe something that's evolved in the desert, maybe that whole thing's going to shift over. And so it really depends. So that's where it gets tricky uh, with uh, the range of tolerance, because you got to figure out what, what do those numbers really mean when you're gathering all these measurements. Um, and so we're going to cut it there for part one, and then we're going to, I hope to see you again here for part two, which is going to be about the, uh, the biological piece of it, which is also a really important piece. But thanks for being with me so far, and we'll see you again in a second.